All right, everybody, I am super excited to introduce our next guest, Dr. Andrew Hamilton. He's a professor of astrophysics here at CU Boulder. He's also a fellow at the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics. Uh, he's got interest in relativity and cosmology and, of course, black holes. Uh, Dr. Hamilton was also a contributor to the planetarium film Black Holes, The Other Side of Infinity, which we show here at Fisk. It shows at planetariums all across the country. So we're super excited to talk to you today, Dr. Hamilton. It's a great pleasure, Tara. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So... I'd like to kick things off with what to us seems like a very simple question, but is perhaps the most important question of the episode. And this is uh, coming from all sorts of listeners. The question is, what is a black hole? A black hole is a place where space is falling faster than the speed of light. That's it. So concise, so <laughs> straightforward. You said it's where space is, is falling faster than the speed of light. That's right. People often say a black hole is a place where gravity is so strong that not even light can escape. But that leads to the question, why can't light escape from a black hole? The answer is a simple one. Space itself is falling faster than light inside the horizon of a black hole. And that's why light cannot get out. You may have heard perhaps that nothing go, can go faster than the speed of light. The trick is nothing can go through space faster than the speed of light. But space itself, in Einstein's general relativity, can pretty well do what it likes, including pieces of space-time being able to depart from each other faster than the speed of light. I've really? never well, been that way. That's great. <laughs> that is very, very cool. I have, yeah, that is awesome. So there we go. Let, let me give you a little bit of attribute here. It wasn't me who came up with this idea of space falling faster than the speed of light. It was come up with by two gentlemen, one Alvar Goldstrand and the other Paul Panlevay in 1921. What they did was a piece of mathematics. Curiously enough, they didn't understand the mathematics, and that's very common in the field of general relativity. But nevertheless, they showed, even though they didn't understand it, that space falls faster than light inside the horizon of a black hole. Alvar Goldstrand was a Nobel Prize winner. He won the Nobel Prize in 1911 for his work on the optics of the human eye. And he was on the Nobel Prize committee that in 1921 prevented Einstein from winning the Nobel Prize for relativity. They awarded it to Einstein not for relativity, but for the photoelectric effect. And Paul Palavet is equally interesting because he was prime minister of France on two occasions for a short amount of time before 1921 and after 1921. So it was an interesting set of folks. Sounds like, that's very cool. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I think it's it's really nice to incorporate these kind of historical stories into the science. It makes it a lot more interesting. Uh, you said something that actually leads perfectly into another question that we have for you, um, which is that uh, you've said, uh, as Dr. Andrew Hamilton, that to understand black hole theory, you just have to trust the math. Um, and on the surface, the mathematics in, in the papers that you've written and in you know countless others doesn't look too crazy advanced beyond, you know, an undergraduate mathematics education. So what is it about the math and the equations that is or seems so challenging to trust it? So first of all, even though astronomers see evidence for things that look very much like black holes, stellar sized black holes and supermassive black holes at the centers of galaxies, even though astronomers see these things, we can't go inside so we can't test them. And so in order to understand what these things are, black holes, we have to understand the mathematics. We have to understand the physics. We have to turn that handle. And a priori, one doesn't know what you're going to get. You don't know what you're going to get before you do the mathematics. I got into studying black holes through visualization. I didn't start off with thinking black holes are cool as a research 
project. I thought, what happened was I wanted to teach relativity to undergraduates. And for some strange reason which escaped me, undergraduates seemed to be fascinated by black holes. And so it was undergraduates and teaching that got me into this role of doing visualizations of black holes. And in particular, visualizing what happens when you fall inside the horizon of a black hole, which hadn't been done before. And it's very interesting because I didn't know what it would look like. I did the mathematics, the, the equations of general relativity are quite specific. So you knew what equations to solve and you knew how to do the ray tracing, but you didn't know what it would look like. And then when you did those visualizations, it wouldn't look at all like I expected. <laughs> and in my experience, that is quite typical in general relativity. You do a calculation and you have a preconception of what it should look like. And that preconception isn't borne out by the actual mathematical calculations you do. So if you find yourself sometimes baffled by black holes and possibly baffled by the mathematics of black holes welcome to the club because i'm the first one person to admit i'm constantly baffled it doesn't stop me doing the calculations and eventually slowly figuring out what those mathematical calculations mean but beforehand no i have a success rate of zero percent on anticipating what's the right answer so it sounds like what's really important, you know, when you say trust in the math to, you know, to lead to a greater understanding, say visualizing a flight into a black hole, is to follow the math through and then see what comes out on the other side and kind of, you know, don't, don't treat, that, treat that with any hostility based off of what you had preconceived before you trusted the math. Let me say something about being an astrophysicist and an astronomer. I identify as an astronomer and an astrophysicist. And I think we have a very special relationship with nature, which is to say, we look at nature, and particularly we look up at the heavens and we try to understand what is written in the heavens. And that may seem very bizarre, but somehow or other, the truth about the way the universe is built is is written in the heavens and we can take telescopes and look up there and see how the universe works. It's really an astonishing thing that somehow we are able to do this. We can look from telescopes on the surface of the earth or maybe above the atmosphere and in satellites, the Hubble Space Telescope. But space is transparent. So we can see through space to distant stars and planets. And not only that, but because light moves at the speed of light, and so it takes a finite amount of time for light to get to us from the distant universe, the further away we look, the further back in time we see. And so we see not only the way that the universe is right now, but also the way that it used to be, all the way back to the earliest moments that we can detect the Big Bang. It's astonishing that nature allows us to do that. Well, you know, I think part of what you just said is part of the reason for the name of this podcast, which is A View from Earth. And it is kind of mind blowing to think that, you know, everything that we know in astronomy and astrophysics comes from what we're doing here on Earth. And yet somehow we're able to, to you know, claim understanding about things that are happening you know, incredible distances away from us. Um, so absolutely, yeah, absolutely, very inspiring. <laughs> so fact, yes. Oh, my bad. If, if you had something to say, go ahead. Yeah, the the fact that we claim understanding at the moment. Let me say, it's clear we don't know everything. For goodness sakes, absolutely, There's a whole lot more for us to discover. But we do know things. We know more than we know knew. 100 years ago, 50 years ago, even 20 years ago. And the, it's astonishing to see the pace of our understanding in astronomy. So speaking of the things that we do know, 
uh, and how we kind of break those things up into categories. Um, I've noticed in looking through some of your work that you've referenced several different kinds of black holes, namely Schwarzschild, Kerr, um, and, and earlier you, you, know, you had said something you know, about a, a supermassive black hole. In what ways do scientists in the field categorize black holes and what are the categories? There's something called a no hair theorem, which says that isolated black holes are come in just three varieties. Sorry, let me say that again. But there's a no hair theorem that says that isolated black holes are characterized by just three quantities, their mass, their electric charge, and their spin. So curiously enough, black holes are terribly simple things. <laughs> They're some of the simplest things in all of nature. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, black holes are very complicated things. But actually, fundamentally, no. They're some of the simplest things that can possibly be. If you want to know what I think is complicated, let me tell you the most complicated things that I know are human beings. They are way more complicated than black holes. And I'm so glad that I work on something easy like black holes and not something that is intricate and difficult and hard to deal with, which is human beings. Anyway, let, let me explain about these simple black holes, mass, charge, angular momentum. When a black hole first forms, astronomers tell us that it forms from the collapse of the core of a massive star, something more massive than perhaps 25 times the mass of our sun. Our sun is not going to produce a black hole. You need something much more massive than that. When that massive car, star uh, burns its core all the way to iron, it collapses, and if it's big enough, that iron core can collapse all the way to a black hole. When that black hole first forms from the core collapse of a massive star, it wobbles around, and as it wobbles around, it radiates gravitational waves and loses energy through those gravitational waves. And because a black hole is a place where space is falling faster than the speed of light, there's nothing that can bubble up from below to replace the energy that it loses. So as it wobbles around, it loses its energy and settles into the state where it can no longer lose, it settles to a state where it can no longer radiate gravitational waves. And that's this simple state characterized by mass, charge, and spin. Um, there's, there's this idea that if you were to, you know, get too close to a black hole, right, then, then you would eventually pass this boundary, which we call the event horizon, that, you know, behind which you can't come back out, right? And, and we've heard this word that is uh, apparently a technical word in the scientific uh, community, spaghettification, uh, in which you are stretched out by the tidal forces or the, the the powerful gravity of a black hole and spaghettified into this, you know, piece of spaghetti. And so this is kind of a morbid question that I have for you, but I'm here. I've always been curious. Imagine that, you know, somehow we have the technology to visit a black hole. And so I've, I've, you know, I've flown my spaceship up to this black hole and I step outside and we're inches away from the event horizon. And I say, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I, for science, I'm going to step inside and see what happens. So I cross that boundary and I start to feel, you know, this, this, this effect on my body. And my question is, what, in your opinion, would, would I be able to perceive the fact that I was being spaghettified for any amount of time or would something else stop that first? And would, would my, my kind of conscious perception of reality be halted much before I witnessed the kind of crazy events that we expect to happen near a black hole? Indeed, spaghettification is one way that a black hole can kill you. However, you should be aware of the fact that a black hole has many tricks up its sleeve and there's many ways that it can kill you. But before we go there, let's get a few facts straight. You don't get spaghettified just by going through the horizon. If you get close to a stellar mass black hole, 
by which I mean something astronomers see evidence for stellar mass black holes from five to maybe a hundred times the mass of our sun. If you go close to one of those, you will be tidally torn apart well outside the horizon. You can't get close to those black holes without already being torn apart. So that's kind of a washout. You seriously don't want to visit those kind of black holes at all. However, if you fall into a supermassive black hole, for example, there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy weighing in at 4 million times the mass of the sun. Even though it's more massive, it also has a larger radius. And because it has a larger radius, it's the tidal force that it exerts on you, tearing you apart, head from toe, and squashing you in the horizontal direction. The tidal force from a supermassive black hole is weak enough that you can fall through the horizon without being torn apart. You have to fall rather deep down inside the black hole before you get tidally torn apart. And in fact, there's something that will kill you before you get tidally torn apart, at least if the supermassive black hole is rotating fast enough. And typically they are rotating fast enough. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of speechless. Like <laughs> one, one more little factoid is that you will be spaghettified one tenth of a second before you hit the singularity where the curvature becomes infinite. And that tenth of a second is true regardless of the mass of the black hole. Stellar size, supermassive, it's always one tenth of a percent. And a tenth of a percent is a very nice, comfortable number. It means you just have the beginnings of, oh no, what's happening? But before you've even had that come over your mouth, you're already done. And when we talk about spaghettification, we aren't just talking about, you know, stretching a person out. At, at its height, we're talking about the ripping apart of the particles that make up our bodies. Is that right? Like on a, on a, a scale that is hard to imagine. <laughs> that, that is correct. So you will first get tidally pulled apart in the sense that your, uh, your limbs will be pulled off, your head will be pulled off your neck, and your legs will be pulled off your... You know, it, it's, this is a terrible analogy, but imagine pulling the bones off a chicken or something like that. It takes some force, but not a tremendous amount. But the closer you get to a singularity, the stronger the tidal forces become, becoming infinite at a singularity, and infinity is a very large number. <laughs> and that infinity that means that gravity overcomes all other forces. So it not only pulls you apart, but pulls the electrons out of atoms, and then pulls the nuclei of those atoms apart, and then pulls the quarks out of those, and so on, and so on, and so, forth, so on. Gravity, becomes the strongest force there is and cannot be overcome. So kind of moving, maybe in a, a, a less kind of ripping apart <laughs> way of thinking of things. So in the center of these black holes, you have a really interesting paper that I was reading not long ago called The Black Hole Particle Accelerator as a Machine to Make Baby Universes. I think that's really fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about this sort of, you know, less destruction and more sort of a rebirth kind of thing? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. I wrote that paper speculating on the possibility that black holes might make baby universes as part of the Gravity Research Foundation competition, annual competition. I wrote it in 2012, and I thought it was a fun paper. It not only didn't win the prize or the second prize or any of the prizes. It didn't even get an honorable mention. <sighs> Obviously, the community doesn't have any good appreciation for the finer points of baby making inside black holes. But as a serious fact, it is the case that inside black holes is the most violent environment anywhere else in our universe. And in particular, there's a remarkable general relativistic instability 
that happens at the inner horizons of rotating black holes. Would you like me to tell you a little bit about that amazing instability? Absolutely. Okay, so first of all, you may remember that I said that a black hole is a place where space is falling faster than the speed of light. And where space is falling at the speed of light divide, defines the event horizon of the black hole. Inside the event horizon, space is falling faster than the speed of light and nothing can get out. But in a rotating black hole, there's a centrifugal force and the centrifugal force counteracts the force of gravity. Gravity is always attractive, but a centrifugal force acts as if it were a gravitational repulsion. For example, when the Earth goes around the sun, it goes around in an elliptical orbit. And when the sun, the Earth is far from the sun, the gravity of the sun wins out and the Earth gets closer to the sun. And then as the sun, the Earth gets closer to the sun, the centrifugal force becomes more important and it sends back the Earth, sends the Earth back out. And so there's a constant battle between the force of gravity and the centrifugal force, with the result that we're in a stable orbit on the Earth around the sun. In a rotating black hole, once you've fallen inside, the centrifugal force gets stronger and stronger and stronger. It gets stronger relative to the gravity of the black hole. And that centrifugal force slows back the inflow of space back to the speed of light. And where it slows back down to the speed of light defines an inner horizon inside the outer horizon. It's an outer horizon and an inner horizon. And the inner horizon is where, excuse my language, all hell Blake breaks loose. <laughs> so the inner horizon, you, here's the inner horizon, yes? And, and here's a photon which is trying to go outwards, but is being dragged inwards towards the inner horizon by the fast and the light flow of space. And as it moves, settles down to the inner horizon, it slows down and just sits there and stays there. So the inner horizon is an attractant for light that falls into a black hole. Light tends to collect at the inner horizon of a black hole. That's unlike the outer horizon. Light tends to move off the horizon. If light is just slightly above the outer horizon, it climbs away and escapes if it's just slightly inside the outer horizon, it gets dragged inwards by the faster than light flow. But not so at the inner horizon. The inner horizon is an attractant. Roger Penrose in 1968 first pointed out that we, when you go down to the inner horizon of a black hole, a rotating black hole, or possibly a charged black hole, when you go down to the inner horizon, you see the outside universe infinitely energetic and infinitely blue shifting. Infinity is a very large number. And in practice, what happens is that there is a collection of energy at the inner horizon. And that collection of energy reaches and exceeds the energy at the Big Bang. Let me tell you specifically how this works. <laughs> it's, it's not random. So you've got a rotating black hole. And what you do is you throw in a rock. You can imagine throwing in maybe a spacecraft, but a rock will do because rocks are handy. They happen to exist around supermassive black hole. Throw in a rock prograde with the rotation of the black hole. When that rock falls through the horizon of the black hole, because it has extra centrifugal force compared to the rotation of the black hole, that rock essentially turns around inside the horizon and it lowers itself onto the inner horizon and then gets stuck on the inner horizon. Going outwards at the speed of light through space that's falling at the speed of light. Meanwhile, you wait a while and then you throw in a rock, another rock, a second rock, retrograde against the rotation of the black hole. And that retrograde rock has less centrifugal force. So it goes with the flow. And if you aim carefully, you can get those two rocks, the prograde rock and the retrograde rock, to collide with each other. 
And the longer you wait before you throw in the retrograde rock, the larger the energy with which they collide. Specifically, there's something called a black hole crossing time, which is how long it takes light to cross the size of a black hole. For example, the light crossing time for the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy is 20 seconds. So each black hole crossing time that you wait, each 20 seconds that you wait between throwing a prograde rock and a retrograde rock, the energy with which those rocks will collide will double. So if I wait 20 seconds, the energy doubles from whatever it was in the first place. If I wait 60 seconds, that's three doublings, that's eight, it's about 10. You increase the energy by 10. You wait an hour, which is 60 minutes, that's 60 factors of 10, 10 to the 60. That's a huge number. There is no particle accelerator on Earth, or conceivably, you couldn't conceive a part of a particle accelerator that accelerates particle in the usual way through electromagnetic forces as being able to accelerate particles with energy of 10 to the 60 times the number that you first thought of. This means that this gravity powered accelerator that operates at the inner horizons of rotating black holes is an extraordinary machine that is able to accelerate rocks that fall into the black hole to big bang energies and beyond. So, as I say, actually with great ease, you only have to wait an hour or so and you get a big bang energy. You've got to throw in something seriously big like, like rocks would do. You can't throw in dust because it tends to evaporate before the, they hit. It's rather like when a meteorite comes through the Earth's atmosphere, it'll burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. But if it's big enough, it can hit the surface of the Earth and cause chaos and confusion and the extinction of the dinosaurs. Same thing happens with black holes. If you throw two rocks together, or if nature arranges to throw two rocks together, it can do so at Big Bang energies and beyond. In the essay that I wrote for the Gravity Research Foundation, I pointed this out, that there's this extraordinary black hole particle accelerator inside that operates at the inner horizons of rotating black holes. And I speculated that that might make baby universes. To be honest, it's a speculation that I think really deserves a lot more examination than it has received so far at the hands of the physics community. I agree. I thought it was really interesting and super cool. And I think that's one of the things that, that people are so drawn to with black holes specifically is there's so much that you can speculate about um, because, you know, we don't really know all that much. But like you said earlier, we're learning more and more all the time. We know way more than we did 50 or even 20 years ago. So I guess my question... <laughs> I want to push back. I'd like to push back against that word speculate. <laughs> as an astrophysicist, I see my job as to try and figure out what nature is doing. It's like botany. You go out there, you look, and you describe, and you try to figure out what's happening. I'm not sitting here in my office trying to invent clever theories of the universe. As a student long ago, I decided that is not how I'm going to operate. I am going to listen to nature. This is what I told myself as a student. As an astronomer, that's what we do. That's how I'm going to do my research. By nature, I'm very theoretically inclined. I'm very mathematically inclined. So my work is in theoretical astrophysics. But my way of operating is to try and listen to what nature is doing and then do the calculations, not try to invent anything, but to do the calculations as well as I can and try and figure out what's happening. And in particular, this game of trying to figure out what happens inside astronomically realistic rotating black holes has been one that has been driving my research for the last 10 years. It's not something that there's a wide community of people doing. 
there's quite a number of physicists who work on fancy problems of quantum gravity, theories of everything, that kind of thing. And at least historically, I've thought to myself, well, that's kind of a pointless exercise because you're just inventing stuff. As an astronomer, I feel empowered to be able to try and figure out what nature is really doing without trying to make extraneous assumptions and without trying to become famous or win a Nobel Prize. Fair so, enough. <laughs> I should say I have become more interested in high energy physics and theories of, of everything in the last few years because it does seem that in order to understand what's happening inside black holes, in particular in this extraordinary region near the inner horizon where things get banged together at big bang energies, to understand the physics of what's happening there, I need to understand high energy physics and possibly theories of everything. And that kind of perfectly leads into my next question is as someone who, you know, lives and breathes in this field, where do you see the black hole research sort of going or where do you hope that research is going in the near future? I'm going to speak for myself personally. There is a substantial community of astronomers who do real work in real black holes observing black holes one way or another with various telescopes, optical, x-ray, radio. Nowadays, you've heard about the Event Horizon Telescope, gravitational waves being detected from mergers of black holes, all good real astrophysicists. I find myself a little bit lonely in trying to study what happens inside black holes. My excuse is, is that I didn't want to get, I didn't want to fall inside a black hole, but because I was doing visualizations and taking people through the horizon of a black hole and trying to figure out what happened, my research basically got preempted and has forced me into that area. And I'm very thankful because it's a fascinating area. Uh, but I would love to see more scientists interested in black holes. I sometimes hear from my colleague, I sometimes hear from my colleagues that the astronomy of black holes stops at the horizon because you can't see beyond the horizon. And there's something to be said for that idea. But on the other hand, what happens is science inside black holes is to me the most interesting question in all of physics and could potentially lead to an understanding of such things as how our universe was made, how baby universes might be made. Is there a multiverse? What are the laws of physics at very high energies? I think these are fascinating questions which can be answered in a more practical way than just sitting down and trying to dream up new ideas. Nature is already giving us clues with black holes. Great, I love it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip down to a different kind of question because I think it flows in really nicely with this. Because um, I wanted to ask you about your website and visualizations that you do because they're really fascinating. We're going to put a link to your website on the on the page because it's really cool. I find these really, really helpful for picturing these processes that are sometimes a little bit, you know, outside of our minds. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what goes into making some of these really cool visualizations? It's not easy, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> I have to tell you a few stories about where this all began, because it was not my idea to fall inside a black hole. This was your fault, or at least people who look a lot like you people in my accelerated track introductory astronomy class back in 1993, who told me that they wanted to study relativity, which I'd never taught before, but I was fascinated personally by relativity, and I was thrilled to have the opportunity to start teaching it. And then three years later, in another accelerated track introductory astronomy class at the University of Colorado Boulder, I asked the students to put together a Fisk Planetarium show on black holes. Those were the days before we were digital, so this was old-fashioned. 
And indeed, they put together a show all by themselves in small groups, and then made a presentation at the end of the semester. The highlight of the undergraduate's presentation was a clip from Stargate, where James Spader goes through the Stargate. You may remember there's this gate, and there's this rippling, swimming pool-like thing there. And James Spader puts his face through the ripple and whoosh goes through a wormhole. That was the undergraduate's finale. And they all whooped and roared and thought it was tremendous. And I have no doubt that they thought that their professor, that was me, was going to be equally impressed. But I had given them some rules about their Fisk Planetarium show. First of all, it had to be original. Clearly, this was not original. Secondly, it had to be scientifically accurate. Clearly, this was not scientifically accurate. Thirdly, it had to have some artistic merit to it, which was up to them. And no, that didn't work. So in those very few seconds where I saw that clip, watched that clip, two things went on my, in my head. One was, this is nonsense. And the second one was, wow, this is interesting. And gosh, Andrew, you could do that. You could do visualizations of black holes. You know the math. You know how to do this stuff. Let's have a go at it. And so I began. We put together, using the undergraduate's planetarium show, a show on black holes that premiered in 1997. And at that time we had monthly astronomy shows and typically we get 60 people in the audience. In January, 1997, when we opened that show, we had more than a thousand people turn up. You have never ever seen Fisk so packed. The lobby was people packed together in the least spatial, <laughs> the least socially distanced way that you could possibly imagine. They were cheek to cheek. And we did back-to-back -back shows that night. We repeated it for several weeks and we kept having that. So it was at that point that I began to realize, oh my goodness, this thing about black holes is really interesting. And that sort of got me seriously involved. So the next part of that story was that the Denver I, so that's when I put out a first website, which was 1997. Because the Fish Show was so successful, I thought, well, I'll take some of the visualization work that I've done here and put it out on a website. And the website crashed the server, usual stuff. We got used to that. It had millions of hits before we, the counter broke. Anyway, come about 2000, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science visited the University of Colorado. Uh, they visited John Bally, my colleague, and John Bally phoned me and he said, you, you want to come by here? There's these people from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science who are wanting to hire us on sabbatical to develop content for their new digital dome, the new re-envisaged Gates Planetarium at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And I said, I'm rushing on over. So I did. And the Denver Museum of Nature and Science ended up hiring both John and myself on sabbatical at the Denver Museum. So I had the privilege of being paid for one year on sabbatical by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to do black hole visualization software, which would go onto their dome. And that eventually happened. It took a while, went on sabbatical 2001, 2002, Digital Dome Show finally came out, directed by my good friend, Tom Lucas, a Nova director, producer. I'm hearing lightning going on outside. <laughs> uh, our show eventually came out in 2006, Black Holes, the Other Side of Infinity. I was part of the core team of making that show, and I did all the black hole visualizations for it, and it was the most fun I ever had in my life. You were asking me a question, and I think I've lost it at this point, what the question was. 
we're um, just talking about kind of the process of, of making some of these visualizations, but you might be happy to know that year over year consistently that black hole show is still our number one draw still to this day. <laughs> I hear from Spitz, who is the distributor of that particular dome show, that it is indeed their number one distributed show of all times and continues to be so at the present time. Let me say one more th thing about the history, because we started going into production on that dome show, digital dome show, at the beginning of 2004. And it was at that point, the beginning of 2004, when Tom Lucas, our director, told me, Andrew, you're going to have to go on TV in order to defend these visualizations and tell us what's happening inside the horizon of a black hole. We were going to do and did not only a digital dome show, but also a, a Nova show which came out the following year. So back in 2004, I thought to myself, really, Andrew, if you're going to go on TV, you ought to know something about black holes. So that is when, for the very first time, I started doing research on what happens inside black holes. I had assumed that there were smart physicists like Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking who would have figured this out a long time ago. And so I thought to myself, it'll take a couple of months. I'll read the literature, I'll become an expert, and then I can go on TV. No, that's not what happened. What I discovered is there's practically no literature on what happens inside astronomically realistic black holes. There's lots of literature on what happens on singularities and quantum gravity and all kinds of mathematical abstractions. And I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to find a paper which was, please tell me, just tell me, what does it look like? What do I see? What do I experience? What's the physics of falling into a real astronomical black hole? Don't tell me about the singularity. I could care less about the singularity. Tell me what happens on the way. So being an astrophysicist and a theoretical astrophysicist, I did what we do, which is I started doing calculations. I didn't know where it would lead, didn't know what I was going to get to, but that's what we do. I started throwing stuff into a black hole and seeing what happened to it when you threw stuff in. And it kept blowing my mind. It was in 2008 that I first came across this extraordinary instability at the inner horizon of a black hole. I began to understand just how violent and vicious it was. And I wrote a series of papers which believe it or not, were rejected. <laughs> this must be wrong. We haven't heard of this before. Surely somebody must have done this before. And this has been my experience in this particular field. You follow your nose, you find stuff that people haven't mentioned before, you submit it, and it gets rejected, and you've got to fight your way. One of these days, I'm going to win. And I'm confident of, of that because, again, going back to the mathematics, one of the wonderful things about mathematics is after you've done it and you've checked yourself and double checked yourself and, and done every possible test, you know you're right. You do not need an expert to tell you whether you are right or wrong. The mathematics can be relied upon. And that makes me very happy because it means this sounds terrible. I know I'm right. And there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so I've got, I want to, uh, sorry, Tara, we're kind of going out of order on our little question set here, but this is such a lively conversation. I want to chime in with this. Uh, the One of the, perhaps, if not the most famous sci-fi film that centers on a black hole is Interstellar. Right, and in that film, uh, the main character, uh, you know, eventually goes into this black hole, which is which is named Gargantua, and of course, this is they're using sci-fi all over the place, right, to make this engaging story and tell the story the way they want to tell it. Is there anything th that they did particularly right 
when they when they kind of filmed that scene and showed what was going on there or anything that you want the listeners to think about the next time they watch the film Interstellar uh, you know with the exception that of course this is fiction and it is sci-fi but is there anything that as a, an expert on black holes you can say oh this is something to keep in mind the next time you're watching this film <laughs> My wife took me to Interstellar as a birthday present. And I think the thing that she remembers most that it was it, it was three hours long, which was much more than she could take. I knew about that Kip Thorne was planning to make Interstellar for many years. I think those of us who have known Kip Thorne in some acquaintance or another, have known that he's he had plans to make a movie. And I have always been jealous of that. <laughs> I would love to do the same thing. I think it's one of the most fascinating things that one could conceivably do. And there's lots of really amazing elements in Interstellar, in particular that image of the rotating black hole Gargantua that you see from outside, that is gorgeous. That ray tracing was done by the double negative team in London, and they did an absolutely tremendous job. If you want to know exactly how they can do, how they did that job, you can buy the book by Kip Thorne on Interstellar. There's a book that explains all the science of Interstellar, and it's a fascinating book. And they did a fantastic job of doing the ray tracing. They didn't do the ray tracing correctly inside the black hole. They guessed it. I guess they gave up. I guess that's going to be in my future. I have to do that. I still have not done the ray tracing inside a rotating black hole. And somebody somewhere on our planet should do that. And I guess it's going to have to be me. However, there were a whole bunch of rather disappointing things about that Hollywood movie, which is to say the story was very full of Hollywood memes which were not really scientifically accurate. For example, this idea of going down to a planet in orbit around Gargantua, and you may remember one hour went by on that planet. I think it was called Planet Miller. One hour went by. Meanwhile, seven years went by on the outside world. And it's certainly true that there's some gravitational time dilation which causes some change in the time. If you go down to a planet around the black hole and come back out again, you'll find your time slightly different. But that one hour to seven years is absolutely absurd. <laughs> to make that happen, the planet would have to be so close to the inner horizon as to be essentially, sorry, the planet would be, have to be so close to the outer horizon as to be almost on it. And the only way that you can have something in orbit at the outer horizon is to have what's called an extremal black hole with the maximum possible angular momentum. And that max, the, in order to get a planet to do that, the, the black hole would have to be one part in 10 to the 14 from extremal, which is a, an absurd idea. As Kip Thorne himself once showed, the closest that you could get in the most favorable circumstance is within about a percent or maybe a couple of tenths of percent of extreme, not one in 10 to the four. So that was all wrong. And then these mile wide tidal waves, utter nonsense. So it was sad to see all these unnecessary Hollywood stories patched in on what could have been a scientifically accurate film. What I would really love to see in the future is a Hollywood movie that really respects the science. I believe that science is full of stories that are at least as good as, if not better, than the ones that the Hollywood people make up. If we could work together with the scientists respecting the filmmakers and the filmmakers respecting the scientists, both giving the best of their own, we could put together a Hollywood blockbuster, which would be true in every possible aspect to the science. That doesn't mean that it has to be nerdy or boring or whatever, because a lot of what stories is about is about people, about 
the hero and the heroine and the villain, the, the protagonists and the conflicts that they have. And that's where all the complexity and the richness of the film come in. But there's no reason to sacrifice scientific accuracy in order to allow those kind of human conflicts to occur and build a really good story. That sounds like some project that perhaps you could head in your future with this vision of, of you know, keeping both and making something fantastic out of both of those things. Maybe that's your film right there. <laughs> I wouldn't say head. One of the things one has to learn in working on movies, I, I learned this working with Tom Lucas, who's an amazing director, producer. It is a collaboration between many people of many different talents. We had a musician, we had a writer, we had people who had CGI, computer graphics work. They had me doing some scientific stuff. They had advisors. They had all kinds of people. And I had the privilege of talking to these people and each one of them was an absolute expert in their own right. This is one of the joys of collaborating in these things is being a little bit of an expert on your little tiny thing, but there's this whole family of people who together build up this amazing pool of talent. So when they put it all together, they can produce something that just blows your mind. That's what I would like to be part of. Well, I think uh, perhaps one day, that's a pretty compelling thought to me if, if for, you know, if I had the capability to, you know, as a filmmaker to decide, let's try and make a film about this. If someone like yourself came up to me and said, hey, I've got this idea and I, what I want to do is make a film that tells the story of nature without making anything up, you know, and, and kind of sell it the way you just sold it to us, I would hands down be ready to jump on that. I think that would be a really cool experience. And a really cool well, if film. you have $10 million in your pocket, let's do yeah, it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, let's, let's take a step back here. Uh, we've kind of, you know, on, on Terra and Izen, we've got this Google Doc up and we've got all these questions here that we have for you. And we've kind of been jumping around because this conversation has been so alive. Uh, Tara, do you have a preference? Kind of what direction we go next um, as far as, you know, continuing? Um, let's jump, let's get back in order and we'll jump back up um, because I want to ask you some questions about your experiences in education because obviously you teach in the department, um, you've done podcasts and you lecture at Fisk and things like that. And you also participate in uh, CU Wizards, which is a program that we do at the university aimed at middle and high school kids. So I'm curious as a fellow presenter and educator, what is your strategy for sort of breaking down this large, what some people consider a complex topic to, you know, kid sized bites or, you know, public audiences, things that are more accessible? The first thing that you have to know about students is that the younger they are, the more enthusiastic they are, and the more difficult it is to go wrong with them. <laughs> it's, it's lovely. It would be so much fun to be an elementary school teacher or a middle school or a high school teacher. I get stuck with teaching undergraduates for goodness sake. You know, you, you've got to the point where you spend most of the class looking glumly at your professor. That is not something that happens with elementary or middle school kids. They're ir irrepressible. You can't stop them from bubbling over. And basically, whatever you get them to do, they're going to do it with, with gusto. So the key thing is to get them to participate. Whatever you do, it kind of doesn't matter what they do, as long as you get them to participate in some way or another, they're going to do it. One of our favorites was using a treadmill to behave like a black hole. It's going faster and faster and faster, and now it goes faster than the speed of light and throws you off the end. So you have all these kids throwing themselves off the treadmill, and you know, it's, <laughs> it's just a heck of a lot of fun, is all I can say about that. 
Excellent. That does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> Um, and in working with, you know, kids and adults, public audiences, that sort of thing, do you ever find there's any really sort of common misconceptions that you end up clarifying a lot or things that you especially like to harp on? <laughs> <laughs> the world of black holes is, I'm sad to say, packed with misconceptions. Ah, deary me. These are statements that are made often by my colleagues and often repeated in the popular literature. And here I am saying that these are misconceptions. Why? Based on my own authority. Why do I say that? Because I've done the calculations and I did the calculations expecting to get the standard result and lo and behold, they didn't agree with what people say. And you've got to believe the mathematics. So eventually you say, oh, okay, I have to revise my thinking here. Let me give you probably the most classic example is a statement that is very commonly made that a black hole is a place where matter get compressed, gets compressed to an infinitesimal point called the singularity at the center of a black hole. That is wrong. Would you like me to name a list of famous people who have stated that? Neil deGrasse Tyson? Tyson? Neil deGrasse Tyson? What's his name, Brian Greene? Never mind. There's, there's a whole bunch of people who say that the singularity of a black hole is a point where all the matter that's accreted into the black hole concentrates into an infinitesimal point of infinitesimal density. Here's the problem. If you fall into a black hole, imagine two people falling into a black hole. And it's a spherical black hole. Let's make it that way, non-spinning. So it has something called the singularity of what appears to be at center. So these two, two people try to fall in and they try to fall in at the same time. And the question is, do they meet? The answer is they, they don't. Because inside a black hole space is falling faster than the speed of light. So, if you're inside a black hole, whichever direction you're looking at, you're looking, always looking at outside your position. Let me take you through this a, a little bit more carefully. So people ask this question, for example, suppose I fall feet first through the horizon of a black hole. What happens? So you're going to be freely falling. You're not going to be fighting it. You're going to be freely falling, and so your feet fall through the horizon of a black hole. At the moment your feet fall through the horizon, your eyes are outside, so they, you're looking down at your feet, your feet are below you. Your feet emit light, and because space is falling at the speed of light at the horizon, the light that your feet emit sits there at the horizon, barreling away at the speed of light through space that's falling at the speed of light. Meanwhile, your head comes down and catches up with the light from your feet. And the question is, do you catch up with your feet? No, you don't. You look down, you still fee see your feet below you. And if you continue to fall inside the black hole, you look down, you still see your feet below you, but you see an image of your feet as they used to be above your head. Yes, your feet inside the black hole, your Feet emit light upwards, but because space is falling faster than the speed of light, it drags the, the light downwards like a Michael Jackson moonwalk, and your eyes eventually catch up with that. I want to do a little aside here, and you can edit this. This is something that it seems the community doesn't understand very well, in particularly with regard, for example, to Hawking radiation and quantum gravity. Hawking radiation, Hawking told us, is emitted at the horizon of a black hole. And it seems like many physicists imagine that when you fall to the horizon of a black hole, you will catch up with the Hawking radiation. Well, no, you don't catch up with the Hawking radiation. You don't catch up with the light from your feet, and you don't catch up with the quantum radiation called Hawking radiation. So there's some deep misconceptions about the nature of of the horizon 
amongst the quantum gravity community. Back to where I was. You, you can just cut all of that out. It was too, too advanced. Where were we? Yeah. So the light that's emitted inside the, a black hole has to be falling inwards. And in order for light for me to be able to, I really want to show you a picture. Am I allowed to show you an image instead? This is getting too complicated. You can. The trick is that we expect a large portion of the listeners to be listening audio only. So they will not get the experience of looking at the picture. Uh, and if we're in over our heads, that's OK. We can kind of <laughs> back out of this, let, this let analogy. Me can, <laughs> let me see if I can summarize what's really going on. So you've got two people who are falling in at the same time, or try, at least trying to. But because of this strange business of space falling faster than the speed of light. And I can imagine I'm one of those infallers and I'm looking, I'm trying to look at this other person here, but because space is falling faster than the speed of light, I'm actually seeing stuff from outside of me. And if I try and connect my light rays to the other person, I find that they connect only when the observer is well away from the horizon, sorry, well away from the singularity. So the net result is I not only do not collide with this other person at the center, but I lose causal contact with this other person already well away from the singularity of the black hole. And if we lose causal contact, that means that when we fall to the singularity, we fall to two causally separated pieces of space time. So the right way to think about the singularity is it's actually a surface. When people fall along different angular positions, they fall to a different point on that surface. The singularity of a black hole is a surface and not a point. If you want to understand what that surface is, you do have to go beyond general relativity. You have to understand quantum gravity. But within the context of general relativity, you can say without any doubt, the singularity is a surface and not a point. So I'm curious, and this, uh, John, can also be edited out too. This is all right. But now I'm just curious. So I have to ask, you know, it, what you've said makes perfect sense to me, at least in the sense of like, yes, you know, these things can't catch up to each other and would be causally separated. Um, and, and, you know, clearly the, the math says that, right? That yes. we believe what the math says. So I'm curious why there are so many people in the community that still say otherwise. You know, like you said, there are these huge figures that are saying, no, no, it's this, it's this single point and everything is, is together at this point and it's just a point. Like, why do you think that, you know, why is there this weird disagreement between people in the community talking about what happens? The reason there appears to be consensus is people believe what other people say and they repeat what other people say. I have a joke that says the most widespread proof amongst physicists is proof by repetition. You say something over and over and over again, and one of these days it becomes true. It sounds as though I'm being rude to my fellow physicists, but the truth of the matter is we have to trust each other. I can't double check every possible calculation that everybody else is doing. So most of the time, I have to read the literature. And if this is what people say, then I'll say, I'll believe that. I'll believe there's a body of expertise that, that says this is so. And I will repeat that. And I will assume it's right. However, if you get to be an expert, one of the things that you have to do is you actually have to do the calculations yourself. And you have to check them. And in the case of what happens inside black holes, sadly, there are very few people on the planet who do those calculations. I'm not, again, talking about quantum gravity and is there a singularity or is there not a singularity? I'm talking about what happens outside the singularity. What happens, what do people see? What do people experience? Is this point two observers close to the singularity, are they causally connected with each other? That's not to do with the singularity itself. It's to do with ray tracing outside the singularity. 
Again, there's very few people on the planet, sadly, who are looking at these kind of things. So it doesn't surprise me that there's an ethos out there, out, out there that says the center of a spherical black hole, that point at the center where the curvature becomes infinite is a point. And definitely everything seems to go to that point. Therefore, it must be infinite density. It makes an awful lot of intuitive sense. But when you do the calculation, you find your intuition is wrong. And then you have to back off your intuition, believe the calculations, and then you have the difficult job of persuading your colleagues that they are wrong, or at least what they have been saying is incorrect, and they need to revise their perspective. Well, and that's a nice tie back to what we were talking about earlier, of, you know, trusting the math and, you know, not, not kind of reacting uh, violently towards your answer if you have this preconceived notion. Um, so... So I think we're kind of getting close-ish to the end here, um, but there's a couple more questions that we have that are a little less sciencey and a little more personal. Um, so let me go. Let me go here, and we've kind of talked about some of this so far. Um, could you briefly tell us about your history? What did you want to do growing up as a young child, and how did that evolve into doing what you do today? And of course, we have touched a little bit on you know how that undergraduate class kind of opened the door to you studying the interior of black holes. Did you always want to teach? Did you always want to be an astronomer? You know, can you give us a little bit of of uh, you know light on what's how that all happened for you? Yeah, it wasn't an orderly thing. <laughs> I didn't have everything planned out from the beginning. It's kind of chaotic and, and random. And I have to say, I feel hugely privileged to have landed up where I am. Let me give you a few hints, of, though, of what happened in my youth. There's no question that I was very good at mathematics. That was my talent. Everybody has to have a talent. <laughs> I wasn't very good at people, but at least I could do mathematics. I went to Oxford to study pure mathematics, which is what I did for my undergraduate degree, and eventually got to the point where I began to understand what pure mathematicians did. I had thought that pure mathematicians were really smart people. That's one of the reasons why I was following their footsteps. And I was quite disappointed to see that, that real mathematicians spent their time proving theorems. And that really did not appeal to me. <laughs> And so I, I abruptly left that field of mathematics and went into some business. I found myself a job and started earning a ridiculous amount of money. It doesn't matter what I was doing. But shortly after that, some friends of mine started asking me some questions in astronomy. And that was a field that I'd never heard of before, believe it or not. This is the ghettoization of of science. You can be a mathematician and have no clue about this field called astronomy. So I started reading books on astronomy and astrophysics. And I was completely blown away by this field, which had the temerity to ask these huge questions about actual nature. And it didn't escape my notice that they use mathematics a lot of the time. And for me, the mathematics was like, wow, I can finally use this toolbox. I have a spanner. I know exactly what, you're meaning, what you mean by all this. So the mathematics for me was the opposite of a barrier. It was like a give me more, give me more kind of thing. So for five years, I had a job in the real world. But as it went on, I became more and more hooked by astrophysics. I was reading books all the time. And I became a little bit depressed because I thought, I can't stop myself doing this. And in the end, a colleague of mine, maybe you can tell that I'm British here, a young person that I knew said, you should try America, they'll take anybody. So I applied to graduate school to six American schools, not including the University of Colorado Boulder, but including the University of Virginia. And a posteriori, I discovered that I was quite well qualified. I hadn't realized I was quite well qualified, but I got into graduate school at the University of Virginia, and that was a tremendous privilege for me. I started, I didn't start by being interested in, in black holes. I started 
curious enough in the solar system. <laughs> And then I got interested in stars, and then I got interested in the interstellar medium, and then I got interested in galaxies, and then in cosmology, and finally made my way to, to black holes. So it's been a little bit like climbing this mountain in this very random kind of way. And I don't know if this is the last thing I'm ever going to do. I feel as though I'm probably headed back towards theoretical physics via black holes. We'll see where it goes from here. That's fabulous. And I think the more we talk to people, a lot of people have that sort of circuitous route to where they end up now. Um, but on the other hand, what would you say to someone who is really excited about black holes and this quantum physics and gravity and stuff and kind of wants to do what you do? Where Do you have any advice or uh, direction for somebody who really wants to get into this? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, the, the reason I say this, it's in part my own experience, and I know it's prejudiced. First of all, you need to do what you want to do. You should follow your own dream and not listen to the likes of people like me. When I followed my dream, the thing that I did was I wanted to get to learn the tools of astronomy and astrophysics. So I did things like learning atomic and molecular physics and radiative transfer, how spectra work. You look at stars or you look at galaxies, whatever they are, they produce spectra. How do you analyze those? How do you figure that out? And at that time in, in my youth, NASA pays good money for you to analyze spectra that, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope takes. So that was a good thing for me. I would really encourage you to, to get the tools of the trade and to be as broad as you possibly can. Don't go narrow, go broad. So one of the things, for example, I find in my studies of what happens inside black holes and finding that some other people in that field are mathematicians and theoretical physicists who I discovered don't have a clue, excuse me <laughs> about this, about how gas works or how radiation works how radiative, radiative transfer or hydrodynamics of all those things. And I feel, well, why not? This is what we do in astrophysics. If you want to throw something into a black hole and find out what happens to it, you need to know these things, not just quantum gravity. Actually, you don't need to know quantum gravity to do astrophysics. So my advice to you is, is go broad. Second thing I would say is, is the way that I see it at the moment, trying to figure out what happens at singularities of black holes, or maybe in making baby universes, whatever it is, is like the top of Mount Everest. At least that's the way I see it at the moment. If you want to learn to climb Mount Everest, you better climb the foothills first. And it doesn't matter if they're not Mount Everest, and it doesn't matter that they're small hills. You climb up them and you learn how to do this and you get some satisfaction about conquering this one, and then you go on. My advice would be, do your best to head upwards <laughs> rather than downwards. <laughs> Inevitably, in research, you can have ups and downs, but if you can make the ups exceed the downs so that on average you're kind of climbing up the ladder, then that's good. And yeah, you're not gonna make your greatest discovery if you're 25 years old, you can get to be as old as me and still think that your best discovery is in your future. Very good. Uh, well, I think that, that that pretty much concludes the questions that we have prepared for you. Um, and so, and that was, that was exactly, this has been exactly my vision of one of these interviews. We've just done a couple of them so far. But this kind of just conversational flow is so is just so nice. So thank you so much for you know being so willing to share with us all of your thoughts and your background and your experiences. So let me ask you a question. Okay. Ooh, this is fun. <laughs> How many people do you imagine you're going to get in your podcast? Well, right now we've confirmed a handful, probably around a dozen. We've booked interviews with people uh, through the end of July. How many um, audience? What, how big is your oh, audience? Oh, audience, my bad, my bad. Um, 
I don't know. I don't have a number yet, actually. Tara, do you have a number? I haven't really thought about that. We, so far, we basically looked at, we have about 300 YouTube followers. So this will be broadcast on our YouTube channel. Um, and we're getting, back when we were doing, during the year, we were doing some educational uh, broadcasting on YouTube. And we were getting, I think on one time we got about 100 viewers on that one. Um, and then it's being blasted out to all of our social media. So that's another couple hundred people. So this is kind of our first foray into this podcasting. And we're actually still really new at, you know, being on the internet with all of this. So hard to say at this point, we're hoping a lot. <laughs> well, good luck. Yeah. I hope this works out for you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And we have to say thanks to you. I mean, the podcast wouldn't be able to exist the way that you know we kind of hope that it will without people like yourself being willing to hop on and just chat with us about all of these things so thank you so much for for giving us your time and, and the time of day uh and access to your your wealth of experiences it's been a pleasure colin and tara and john i have Great. one more personal question for you dr hamilton that is about this inner horizon that you were telling us about if I visualize this, a black hole, you know, as this kind of just like black sphere in space, in space, on the inside, is it correct to think that there is almost like this, uh, what could exist as a physical boundary between, you know, the outer horizon and what would be the surface of that, you know, singularity or the surface of the center of the black hole, where some of those, you know, uh, materials that, that have achieved this balance between the outward force of the centrifugal force and the inward force of gravity, does that create a sort of boundary if you could look at it without worrying about, you know, the, the fact that you can't really look at stuff normally inside of a black hole? Well, first of all, the inner horizon is the last place you're going to get to in any realistic black hole. Oh, any okay. rotating Any rotating black hole has an inner horizon. The Schwarzschild black hole, the spherical black hole, is the only one which doesn't have an inner horizon. So you can't pass the interhorizon in principle. Like that is the last stop once you get there. In the exact mathematical solutions for black holes, you can go through the inner horizon. It takes you into a wormhole, turn the flow of space, turns back around, it's driven by the centrifugal force, goes through a white hole and joins a new universe. In fact, it, there's a whole ladder of black hole, white hole universes go back into the black hole, through a wormhole, back through a white hole, into another universe. Those mathematical solutions don't happen in real astronomical black holes. Any black hole which accretes, even the tiniest amount, the accreting matter collects at the inner horizon, it collides with other stuff that falls into the black hole, and then that result is there's an infinite, or at least an enormous concentration of energy at the inner horizon. And that enormous concentration of energy kills the inner horizon. It, 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 it collapses the inner horizon down to a singular surface. And before it achieves that, it's, it's conceivable that it could make baby universes. At least that's a place where through this black hole collider mechanism, you can bank things together at Big Bang energies. If there's anywhere in our universe where baby universes are being made, this is guaranteed to be where it's being made. So yes, it's a barrier. You will not get beyond the inner horizon. If you survive spaghettification, which you will, if it's rotating rapidly enough and it's a supermassive black hole, then you will die at the inner horizon because you will be met by this enormously blue shifted energetic burst of radiation. And it will kill you in an instant. So it's a very nice way to die. Thank you for entertaining my question there. I, I now realize I'm kind of being selfish with our time. So I apologize, but thank you. That was, it's, there's just so <laughs> many questions that indoors that this conversation has opened up. So perhaps I'll reach out again sometime in the future and see. You know, we no might problem. have a moment to chat about more of this crazy stuff that we're learning about. Well, we've done the, the sign off already, and I think that pretty much finishes things up. 
so so okay. uh thank you again well, thank so you. much for for being here it's been a pleasure to have you absolutely thanks for all the work that you're doing for fisk it's so fantastic to see you guys doing that and i must say i'm i'm terribly impressed not just with you but the rest of the fish staff and with the fish director john keller who as far as I'm able to see, is doing an absolutely fantastic job of keeping Fisk floating and thriving in these difficult times and getting all of you guys functioning in the best possible way. So thank to, to you all 